I'm uh, really happy to introduce their, our next speaker, who's a very close friend of mine. We drove together to get here. We're going to be driving home. Um, Peter Robbins. He has been in this field for many decades. He was just telling me his very first time speaking at a conference was back in uh, 1981, I believe. Uh, right after that asteroid hit the dinosaurs, if you remember. So he's been doing this a long time. Uh, Peter, um, there's a lot to say about him, and I won't be able to say it all. He was a very close friend of Bud Hopkins, an associate and, and a research colleague with the great uh, abduction researcher Bud Hopkins, knew him very well. Um, wrote the uh, best-selling book, Left at Eastgate, about the Rendlesham Forest incident. And, of course, with his uh, co-author, has had a few uh, interesting developments that have happened over the past year or two about that. And um, But Peter's done a lot of other work. He's uh, uh, did some excellent research on uh, U former U.S. Secretary of Defense James Forrestal, who uh, leapt to his death or was thrown to his death back in 1949. Uh, Peter is a, a, a great student of the um, psychology genius Wilhelm Reich. Uh, he could probably talk for hours and hours about that. And um, is a real student of uh, UFOs in media and in advertising. Um, he's given a number of very interesting talks about media coverage of UFOs over the years. He knows this very well. And now is giving a talk for the first time, I believe. Is that right? That he's doing this particular uh, lecture, which is an analysis, as he says it here, UFOs and alien imagery in advertising. And we've all, we all wonder about this, right? When we see alien and UFO imagery in, in, our, in our pop culture, like what's really going on here? Uh, he says the key disclosure strategy or income driven marketing decision. Good question to ask. Uh, I think we're really going to enjoy Peter Robbins. Thank you, Peter. Good morning. It is great to be back in Exeter, and I mean that in two ways. The uh, conference that we have here every year, I'm very proud to have been a part of it on and off from the very start, and to visit this historic town. As somebody who might have been an architect or a historian in another life, just walking around and looking at these beautiful buildings and the history they embody, means more to me than I can say. Um, I've been given an hour and 15 minutes, which is actually a little more time than I need, which I'm delighted about because I can begin by uh, talking a little bit about how projects like this develop and where that push to do research uh, and the enjoyment in it and how you manage to come up with something original that didn't exist before. <clears throat> I became deeply involved in the subject of UFOs to the point of obsession. Uh, the expression might be overnight, but in my case in about 90 seconds, um, when uh, a memory, a childhood memory of a sighting that I had with one of my sisters growing up on Long Island, about 30 miles east of Manhattan, um, was so overwhelming to me. It was five silvery white disks in a very precise V-type formation. Uh, clear blue sky, a day as beautiful as yesterday. Um, and it was too much for me as a, a little boy. Um, and I repressed the memory. I will jokingly say if I have any other repressed memories from childhood, I do not remember what they are. But um, more than 14 years later, for a number of reasons that I think I understand, the memory came roaring back into my consciousness with a vengeance. And it happened within a few short minutes. Um, I think the most important reason that the memory came back when it did was because I was ready to deal with it. And uh, it was shattering. I, I don't think the phrase repressed memory existed in the lexicon at the time, but certainly repressed memories did. And I thought that I must be going a little crazy because my conscious mind said, how could you ever forget that? But we are amazing creatures, and if we need to, we do what we need to to survive. Uh, it, in so many words, threatened everything that I thought I knew as a boy. And a very sophisticated boy I was. Leave it to Beaver. 
was basically my childhood. Um, and after calming down a bit, I knew I had only one option, which was to call my sister. I was, uh, uh, at the time, pursuing my career as a painter uh, in New York. I had a loft down in Chinatown. My sister was a, a aspiring poet living in the East Village, a mile or so north of me, and I called her. I had enough foresight to think it through and know that if I just blurted out what I remembered, she'd say yes or no. But I would probably not know for sure in my heart whether she shared the same memory. So I set the scene the weather, the time of year, the time of day, where we were standing in proximity to each other on the front lawn, and she cut me off mid-sentence and said, stop, I know what you're talking about. And then, with one permutation that we weren't sure of that we settled the next day doing some drawings, she told me exactly what I remembered, and it was an incredibly validating moment. And then she said, but there's more, and I don't think you're gonna like it. And then she went on to describe the beginning of an abduction that she had. This was more than 40 years ago. It was at a time when abduction studies really weren't even part of ufology yet. Uh, Bud Hopkins' book, um, Missing Time, the first seminally important book about abductions per se, as opposed to uh, John Fuller's book about the incident at Exeter, uh, or the um, writings on Betty and Barney Hill, that was about all that existed. And the term gray wasn't in you know, the world, that kind of thing. Bottom line though, was she described memories and moments to me that I had never heard anything like in my life. Now I've heard them sometimes word for word hundreds of times, as have many other researchers. And so within a day, my career as a painter, although it continued, and I continued to teach painting for years, the heart had gone out of it. I had something more important to do and I resented it. And here I am more than 40 years later talking about it right now. In 1987, I attended um, a MUFON symposium. It was a big one. It was in Washington, D.C. at American University. And it marked the 40th anniversary of Roswell, Kenneth Arnold. Um, I already had been in the work for about a dozen years, um, had written a couple of papers, given them at conferences, and there were some wonderful presentations at that conference. Also, you know, being in Washington, D.C., there was a seated congressman uh, in the audience, Claiborne Pell of Rhode Island, who, when we approached him and asked him why he was there, he smiled and said, I'm interested in the subject as a civilian. Mm -hmm, good. Um, the talk that had the biggest impression on me, and I'd like to dedicate this talk to that speaker, was an amazing piece of research given by Stanton T. Friedman, somebody known to almost all of you. Uh, now, certainly the most senior, beloved, absolutely giant uh, UFO researcher. I saw him uh, in July uh, speaking in Roswell. He's 82 now. He is still going on all six burners. Uh, he's at the height of his form as a speaker. And he jokes that his parents both lived to be 90 and he wanted another eight years to do his work. Uh, and may he have at least that many. His talk was titled The Secret Life of Dr. Donald K. Menzel, a name that may ring a bell for some of you and not for others. Dr. Menzel uh, ostensibly was the uh, head of the astronomy department at Harvard very prestigious position, honored uh, academic, very connected, but he lived a secret life. He was deeply embedded in the American intelligence community and kind of the godfather of Philip Klass, the arch debunker who made life so miserable for myself, Travis, uh, the Hills, and so many other good people uh, over the years. And the thing that distinguished Stan's research from anything that had ever been done in Dr. Menzel was he had gotten permission from his widow to go through all of his private papers. He had gotten permission from Harvard to go through all of his archive there and then in the National Archives. Stan is a superb researcher and I came away from that talk thinking this is what I want to do. This is exciting. This is important. 
And it was the summer that the whole MJ-12 story broke. And that first nine pages was released. Uh, the so-called Eisenhower briefing document and the attached one-page letter from Truman to the brand new first Secretary of Defense, James Vincent Forrestal. There are now purporting to be several hundred pages regarding MJ-12. My feeling is they may or may not be authentic. Probably some of them are very clever disinformation, others who knows what. I honestly don't care. That briefing document, as far as I'm concerned, and certainly as far as Stan was concerned, is authentic, as was that letter. And I thought, hmm, inspired by Friedman's talk, I'm going to choose one of those 12 people, and I'm going to research that person's life and see what I can come up with. About a week later, I was having dinner with my parents, and I mentioned that I was going to take on this project, and I had gotten it down to three finalists. One um, was a man named Sidney Sowers, a uh, admiral who was the first head of the CIA and was President Truman's uh, national security advisor. They had breakfast together every morning on their own where uh, Sowers would go over the intelligence briefings for the day. Fascinating man. The next, even more interesting, um, was Vannevar Bush, perhaps the most interesting person of the 20th century that 99 out of 100 Americans never heard of. Uh, Dr. Bush was Roosevelt and then Truman's science and technology uh, advisor. But if you go to like who's who from say 1948 or something, you'll see two and a half pages of references to this man. When he was chairman of AT&T, he was the dean of MIT. Uh, he had X number of PhDs. He was just remarkable. The other one was James Forrestal, our first secretary of defense. And my mom said, do Forrestal. I said, why? She said, you can't imagine how important he was to us during the war. His name was in the paper every day with Truman's. There was nobody we looked to more to help us defeat, defeat the Japanese and the Nazis than James Forrestal. He was also charismatic. And I will admit to you, as a girl in high school, I had a crush on him. And I thought, James Forrestal it is. And it allowed me to, I think, do one of my best pieces of research. And in doing so, um, very chillingly, and I think I could establish it in the court of law, that James Forrestal was not um, a tragic suicide following a profound nervous breakdown, but that he was murdered, be that as it may. With that as backstory, where did this come from? Well, I began my UFO research, and um, obsessions thread through different things. Uh, I love The New Yorker, and every once in a while there'd be a cartoon in it with a little alien or a landed saucer, clever, witty, whatever. And I clipped it and put it in a separate manila folder. And then one day I saw an ad with a UFO theme selling something to somebody. Bang, another file, that goes in. Time passes, I saw other ads using UFOs or aliens to try to sell products. Some of them from very tiny publications, little regional products, a local ice cream company, to multinational corporations. And I continued to build the file. And at a certain point, I pulled it out and went through it. I had quite a few images. That got me to thinking that by natural inclination, some of my colleagues may have been doing the same thing for years. And I contacted a number in the States and in England and said, do you do this like I do this, have a file of ads with you know aliens and UFOs? Oh, yeah. I said, can you make copies and send them to me? They did. I put them in order in two ways. I put them in order chronologically. I was able to get back over 40 years. And I put them in order um, in terms of subject matter. If they had certain references to aspects of UFO studies, I kind of pondered them. And being an out-of-the-box person, I wanted to see if I could establish a pattern. Well, let me begin the formal part of my talk now. And um, Richard, who is one of my dearest friends and uh, a great, great colleague, um, I sometimes work from notes. And he says, you shouldn't do that. Have your bullet points up there because my nose is in the paper. Um, I prefer to do it on a talk like this because there's so much minutia to refer to, although I much prefer to work completely extemporaneously, but I don't want to miss anything here. 
For decades, UFO-themed ads have filled our papers. Uh, for some of you, if you think about it, yeah, oh, I remember seeing a couple. Um, the big question that comes around relative to the subject is, is there something significant uh, or overreaching here that we should be aware of? Or is this kind of happenstance? There are two basic schools of thought. One feels that it is understood that there are people high up in the corporate world, the commercial world, uh, the business community, who are so connected that they're aware seriously of the UFO subject. They may know people in government. They may have done their own research. They may be on the board of a foundation uh, or an institute like the Brookings Institution. And either on their own, as an informed uh, activist citizen at their level of the game, or more interestingly, some would say, and perhaps a little more ominously, that they, um, it has been suggested to them that they behave in a certain manner. And perhaps every once in a while have their ad agency or their in-house advertisers have an ad with UFOs and aliens being that it's going to be part of this overreaching process of, you know, substitute your favorite term, the secret government, the intelligence community, uh, internal disclosure, be activity in the United States uh, uh, intelligence community to help condition us. So when it hits the fan, oh yeah, all those ads with aliens are going to help me out here. Uh, the other general group of thinkers feels this is happenstance. Um, I turn a page and I see an ad. It's either clever or funny or maybe provocative. And it has a landed flying saucer and somebody's vision of an alien trying to sell me something. I'm going to stop and look at that. It doesn't matter whether I'm a skeptic or even a debunker or a true believer. Most people find the subject interesting for their own reasons. And the psychology for me would be much like the old days some of you ancient people in the audience like me may remember, record albums. Yes, a 12-inch piece of cardboard with an image on the front, a real possibility for an artwork, and flipping through in the record store, and they're back now, folks, um, you might stop for a particularly provocative image, and if you stop, you might buy it. That's standard sales technique. The same in advertising. I cannot tell you which it is. It might be a hybrid of the two. When we get to the end, we'll discuss that. So, let's go to our first ad. No matter what, there are places and times that we should expect to see aliens in advertising or UFOs. And what better example than back in July of 2007, in the pages of the Roswell Daily Records monthly magazine, Vision. Uh, it was the 60th anniversary of Roswell. Um, it wasn't quite as crazy as the 50th, but ads with alien themes were rampant. And this first example informs uh, us about the alien motorcycle rally, which will, was taking place there at the time. Here, a local company uh, took a more subtle approach, noting that, quote, people come from great distances to shop at Roswell Livestock Farm Supply. And choosing what I think we all agree is an image reminiscent of uh, one of the great scenes in Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Right, uh, down the road uh, on Main Street in Roswell, a smiling green alien at Roswell Toyota will be glad to uh, rent you a Toyota Camry for only $34.95 a day. And as you can see, he's wearing a t-shirt with a UFO on it. What else would he be wearing? Well, the term UFO came into uh, the lexicon about 1956. Before that, it was flying saucers, flying discs, uh, anomalous disks, dispelled two ways, 
now we have UAP. Uh, does anybody know what that is? Unidentified aerial, thank you, phenomena, yeah. Uh, Hillary Clinton popularized that, thank you very much. Um, in advertising, clever people use letters to their own advantage. So, in the first one here, this is the first page of a two-page spread uh, from an Australian weekly publication called New Idea. It ran back in 1994 and promised something um, of the country's more exotic exports like jackfruit, jackfruit, uh, kawano, starfruit, uh, and rambutan. The ad was sponsored by both Safeway supermarket chain and Woolworths. This was major advertising campaign and asked the question, have we been invaded by UFOs? Unidentified fruit objects. The text begins rather predictably. After a visit to the Blue Mountain Fruit Company, you could be forgiven for thinking that you'd had an extraterrestrial experience. And quote, so next time you pick up some apples, oranges, and bananas, check out our range of UFOs. It makes shopping an experience that's, yes, out of this world. We hear that one several times, as you might anticipate. It should be noted also, uh, and this is important, Australia is a country uh, with a particularly high number of corroborated UFO sightings and incidents. It is also a country with a particularly well-organized group of regional UFO organizations and a general population that takes the subject so much more seriously than we do here overall in the States, although that is changing. The advertiser here is the Upchurch Scientific Filtering Company. And uh, the um, first thing that they tell us is now you can see a real UFO. Theirs is an ultimate filtering object. Okay. More than 40 years ago, in 1976, the Merritt Food Company introduced their vision of Carvel's famous flying saucer ice cream sandwich, uh, encouraging retailers to stock up on the product uh, that is, quote, uh, makes a hard landing in frozen novelty cases, end quote. In this case, UFO is unidentified frozen object. All reports confirm that it is extraterrestrially tasty. End quote. Stores that did so also received this in-store display card to help uh, promote uh, the product. And uh, here it is. Okay, um, this ad was placed by the Kansas, the state of Kansas's Department of Industrial Development. And it asks readers, quote, if you're beginning to think the perfect place to locate your business is on another planet, get back down to earth. Uh, we are then invited to locate our business to Kansas for UFO. Unbelievably fantastic opportunities. The French Aerospace Company Intertechnique manufactures products for commercial and military aircraft. In their version of things, a UFO is an unescapable flying object. And while this is not strictly an advertisement, I clipped it uh, for another UFO acronym. Uh, it's a 1990 article uh, having a little fun at the expense of the fashion industry from the Houston Daily Chronicle. Uh, and their uh, uh, acronym is Unusual Fashion Objects. Okay, the big question, one we all ask. This is the way advertisers see it. I'll bet some of you remember this one. In the early 1990s, the National Federation of Coffee Growers of Columbia ran a highly successful ad campaign in many of the nation's largest newspapers and magazines. I include Newsweek, Time, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, on and on down the pantheon of uh, publishers. This most memorable in the series um, 
is the one I, I think that really helped make this a hugely successful ad campaign. The layout, of course, could not have been simpler. And uh, the photo itself has an authentic feel to it. It's one of the very few in the history of using alleged UFOs in advertising that has that grainy, what is it that could be real, that looks authentic kind of photo. In the great Mies van der Rohe uh, uh, quote of less is more, it's one line of copy. And it's brilliant. We know why they're here. All of you coffee drinkers agree. Okay, 1999, a trade ad from Gene Therapy Systems. Uh, out of focus green aliens float down from their hovering craft, one holding a syringe in its hand. Why have they come to Earth? Quote, we are here for Gene Porter too. The copy features such shameless one-liners as alienated by hard to transfix cell lines. Well, are you? Uh, <laughs> um, Gene Porter, has out of this world results. Order today and make contact with the most, uh, the next generation of transfiction reagent. Yes, sir. Even the ad's bullet points, which are not shown here, are little UFOs. Yeah. An ad in the form of a cartoon. The copy, um, uh, the ad is for Envirospace Systems, uh, and they put forward a different thesis in the Wall Street Journal in 1985. This pointy-headed alien informs a bemused earthling that, quote, we're here to learn more about your Enviro spray. And who can blame them? But America's beef producers feel the definitive reason for being visited has to do with earth cows, not its people. Beef. It's what's for dinner. Now, yes, it's funny. But it bespeaks something very serious. Starting about 1976 or so, uh, beginning with an independent investigator, um, a law enforcement personnel in the Southwest, a very disturbing syndrome was seen, the cattle mutilation syndrome. Cows were lifted out of the field. Uh, surgical procedures that were so precise that they separated cells when uh, an area was, was removed. Uh, it literally didn't cut through individual cells. It went between them. Um, when the carcass was dropped down to earth, no predators would approach it. No insects would invade it and start to eat it. The cattle mutilation uh, theme, many people connect to the UFO uh, subject. I don't know. There are legitimate reasons to feel they are connected. Random tissue studies, cows, musculature is not that different than humans. But somebody, either the ad agency or the American Beef Council was doing their homework. And this ad, which is funny, is informed by that very serious fag. Okay. Well, more timely now than ever, and hopefully it's true, the next three ads focus on a concern well known to many UFO abductees. And some of you who study the literature or may have had the experiences may be aware that people who report these incidents sometimes report that among the things that have been put in their heads are absolutely um, catastrophic pictures of Earth's destruction if we don't get our act together. And quite a number of abductees that I have known, especially starting in the 80s working with Bud Hopkins, um, have gone on to become activists in one way or another in environmental causes. So, in the first one here, uh, this one is from Singapore. And it is the Singapore Environmental Council. The quote is, atmospheric pollution affects everyone. It's funny how some of these threads extend all over the world in print ads. Love this one. Uh, National Geographic Kids Channel is responsible for this chillingly clever image. The accompanying text, let's not be the joke of the universe, make Earth proud. Wonderful notion to instill in children and in us. 
Okay, who do you count on for clean environment, says an OAM corporation, as UFOs are seen abducting trash and junk from the landscape in this powerful illusion illustration. If only, right? A favorite of mine. Okay. The film E.T. so insinuated itself in popular American and then world culture that its little long-necked star had gone on to become an iconic, uh, how can I say, non-threatening extraterrestrial or interdimensional presence, depending on your point of view. And while his ability to sell products has may have dimmed a little over the years, children were the target of this 2002 E.T. Nabisco Graham Crackers marketing campaign, which was timed to coincide with the film's theatrical re-release. This similarly marketed package of Kraft Macaroni and Cheese offered an instant win contest. The copy also admonished children and their parents to, quote, see the movie only in theaters. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Not surprisingly, Kraft's parent company, uh, KF Holdings, also owns Nabisco. Uh, no surprise there by the ads. Ali's Playhouse, CD-ROM. CD-ROM, strong. Uh, a cheerfully unthreatening alien, Ali offered children, quote, a magical world of learning uh, on the Ali's Playhouse. CD-ROM, I don't know what area of learning it emphasized, but the material was formulated for three to eight year olds and there is a disclaimer uh, on the package uh, reminding parents that it is perfectly appropriate for curricula for Montessori students as well as public school students. Sarah's Galactic Gummies. For children in search of an alien themed sweet that's acceptable for their health conscious parents, consider Sarah's Gummies. Uh, the all-natural alien-shaped gummies were fortified with vitamins and minerals. Okay, the 50th anniversary of Roswell, 1997, caused a spate of temporary products and lots of new temporary, quick, glossy magazines, both here and in the UK. Other countries possibly as well, but the market was flooded. Um, in the UK, and I know because I spent most of that summer there, uh, this alien chewets hit stores that summer and were only around for a few months. Um, we were told um, that well, the wrappers featured a gray alien head with either yellow or red beams emanating from their eyes. The label included the warning that aliens are out there now. And in 1997, that was being drummed into everybody's head in the Western world. The Gund Corporation, a, uh, a wonderful German company that makes uh, high-end toys. Um, no, actually, it's, it's American-German. Um, they're premier manufacturers of stuffed animals primarily. And the addition of a new teddy bear uh, was appropriate cause for an ad campaign. And they could have named the bear anything, but it's Admiral Byrd. And he came complete with the aviator, aviator goggles, and the ad was theme, campaign was themed Unidentified Flying Gund. Okay. The toast, here's looking at you, assumes new meaning with this Centauri product. Uh, Margarita Mayhem. Five flavors, frozen or on the rocks, and yes, quote unquote, they're out of this world too. Um, Midori, I'm sorry, is the name of the company, and this ad campaign is one that I found extremely entertaining. Japanese brewer and distiller, Suntory Whiskey, a major international brand. Some of you remember the movie, or at least the movie title, Lost in Translation sometimes especially between Asian and English speaking countries something is lost and sometimes it turns out to be hysterical uh, the focus here is a new mixed drink the non-human entity offers us a positive thumbs up while happily sucking down a yellowish cocktail through a straw the ad was laid out in this two-page spread the tagline is quote 
Nothing in this world tastes like an alien secretion. <laughs> yeah, I know what you're going to drink when you hit the bar tonight. Well, all I could think was, who the hell approved this ad? It had to have been one of the most disastrous advertising campaigns in the history of American print. Um, but the alien seems happy enough. So who are we to criticize him? Oh, God. Okay. Well. The Harpoon Beer Company, an American brand, uh, uh, one of its products um, came with the name UFO Unfiltered Wheat Beer. I think it's a great design logo, and what the hell, why not? I will say, um, and I am not, Paid to endorse this product, nor is my friend and colleague uh, Richard M. Dolan, but we both approve of this beer, and as you can see, have for some time based on the color of our hair. <laughs> Cheers. Okay. Freshetta Pizza. I, well, uh, what goes better with beer than pizza? Uh, Freshetta Pizza here offers a dollar off the cost of its highly uh, identifiable disc-shaped objects with the attached coupon. Their motto, try one and you'll believe. This is a favorite. Um, 1976, when smoking was still very cool and fun and healthy. Uh, the Philip Morris Tobacco Company placed this ad in major periodicals around the country. Uh, and apparently not terribly well known to us in the UFO research community at the time, certainly not the general population, is that visitors from other planets also enjoy smoking cigarettes. Uh, this must have been a particularly remarkable cigarette because it caused the alien in the craft to delay making official contact with then, I guess it would have been President Carter, uh, until he finished his smoke, or her. We do not know if aliens keep pets, but we do know that advertisers don't spare our dogs and cats when it comes to alien-themed ad promotions. In 1984, the pet food giant Purina sponsored a meow-off, <clears throat> uh, their, quote, search for the universal meow. Here the cat looks on as a huge close encounter chandelier type uh, craft hovers over its home, quote, if your cat has the best meow in the universe, Meow Mix will appoint him or her ambassador from Earth and his favorite Earthling will win $50,000. Meow, right? I mean, hell. <laughs> okay. But uh, even a cat with the best meow in the universe would have to defer to the extraordinarily powerful little dog in this award-winning print ad. And the dog is so little you can't see it. It is right there. And he has got a grip on that mother. And um, what we find out here is that the dog um, is holding on to the UFO. And how is he or she able to accomplish his incredible feat? Simple, quote unquote, Frisky's New Frisky's variety, now with vitamins, end quote. Okay. Start your and your family's day off with an egg. Advertisers for the Wayland Yucatani Corporation do not specify what kind of egg or... What can I say? <laughs> I didn't make this ad up. <laughs> okay. Condiments are not spared. And um, in the world of UFOs, Long's 100% pure horseradish offers, quote, close encounters of the third kind in three different related pitches. I know. Well, I guess they taste better with Long's horseradish sauce.
self-explanatory. Okay, throughout 1989, the New York Times repeatedly added, uh, ran this little box ad. Maybe it was an inch and a half by two and a half inches or something, encouraging newsstand readers to subscribe to the paper. As a regular reader of the New York Times at that time, I estimate that that year, that little box ad ran at least 50 times and possibly as many as 100 times. Uh, my friend and colleague, the distinguished UFO writer and lecturer, Timothy Good, photographed this poster at the Hong Kong International Airport in 2007. It was to promote the uh, Airport Express. Uh, the UFO depicted um, is an airport in an airport corridor projected a beam of light reading, showcasing the world. One of the most popular and highly visible print ads in America in 1992 was this ad. Again, Time, Newsweek, New York Times, all of the major newspapers. I also focus in, I'm, I could have continued this to the moment, but I'm more interested in a sentimental way in pre- digital uh, illustrations. This would have been a painting. This was not a computer composition. And it's, it's very pretty. It's very poignant. This is an example of Madison Avenue at its best in terms of selling a product with a terrific image and terrific copy. This is how it reads. You're right off the plane. They don't know you from Adam. And you expect to be recognized as a respectable, responsible person of the world, end quote. For me, the subtext here is that it almost seems um, that they want you to think that aliens are people too and should be respected as such. But only if they're carrying an American Express card. Otherwise, sorry. It's simple, it's elegant, it's powerful, and for some people it might have, you know, I'll get a new credit card, might as well make an American Express. 2004, the city of Austin, Texas, employed this striking image of a UFO in a partially uh, civic cause, um, trying to help solve their transit problem. Their ad, mm, I think the team that put it together uh, embraced a, a major negative cliche, not necessarily mean-spiritedly, but that's the way it came off for me. Ha namely, having an interest in UFOs is weird. Uh, and the copy is, need an excuse to be weird? Capital Metro is sponsoring the weirdest commute contest. Be creative and use alternate ways to con commute to help improve the air and traffic congestion, end quote. But again, UFOs, weird. As I collected these ads and began to put them in categories, I was really quite taken aback that the subject of alien abduction uh, was often the theme used, almost always with a humorous aspect. But again, after 1981 and the publication of Missing Time, 87 Intruders and Communion, uh, Communion uh, Intruders miniseries and CBS about 1990, Americans became more and more conditioned to the fact that some people felt or believed that this had happened to them. And it becomes, it is now part of our culture. Whether you believe it or not, if it's happened to you, belief doesn't enter into it. But I was actually taken aback by the number of ads that embrace this theme. Okay, the U-Haul Corporation, um, as many of you know, has... Um, state themes painted on the side of many of their transport vehicles. The uh, one for New Mexico was something of a big deal. The design was finalized in 1997 and the first truck unveiled in Roswell on January 5th, 1998 with the mayor and other town dignitaries in attendance. Um, the fact is that the image itself, although here, unfortunately from a moving vehicle, you don't get it, it's pretty intense. It features a fairly lurid graphic of a crashed saucer sticking out of the ground, impact crater in the background, 
with the big-eyed alien in the foreground. The Roswell anniversary uh, in 1997, the 50th anniversary was not lost on the advertising uh, agency that did a brilliant series of ads for Absolute Vodka. Like most conventional Earth beers, Alien Ale is sold in a carton. But unlike other six packs, this one conspiratorially notes, you are holding the beer Uncle Sam has been trying to keep under wraps for 50 years. Finally, you can taste the Alien Amber experience and join the multitude of believers. This is your mission. Good luck. Brewed in New Mexico, of course. Okay. Whatever the product nugget, and I did an internet search and couldn't find it, uh, it is. This certain saucer certainly looks like it is headed for a crash, if not a retrieval. And saving the best for the last in this series. God, I love that ad. Uh, this is from a Mexican bank, Bank Financiero, and it promised that whatever happens, you'll earn 8.5%. Remember? <laughs> That's an ad. I'd put my money in that bank any day. <laughs> That's fabulous. Okay. Another subject. This came up maybe 15 years or so. The term entered the language, especially in UFO studies. The idea that, well, maybe even 20 years ago now, um, that crashed UFOs were quote-unquote back-engineered and the discoveries we made were applied to and became the basis of our modern digital revolution that we are all living in, taking for granted that each one of you has something in your pocket with more power, more uh, intelligence, more savvy than all of the computers that launched the 1969 voyage to the moon. The copy is Don't Miss the Shot, this 1989 ad um, from GE and um, Sanyo. Admonish photographers, quote, always be ready to capture that special image. The illustration shows a Bob Lazar type craft passing over a vacationer as he stands on a rock ledge with his camera aloft. Next to him, a green-faced alien. The product promoted here is a rechargeable battery a very big deal in 1989, especially for cameras, which promises breakthrough technology. The ad appeared in Popular Science, among other magazines. Oh. I, um, this is sort of sentimental for me. It came out, I think, the year after um, the X-Files hit the screens about 1992 or so. And who wouldn't want to believe in an amazingly futuristic handheld communication device like that? Another favorite. Memorable image of cows stepping from a UFO comes to us from Sony. Even though the farming couple is obviously shaken by the sight, they can record it with confidence because their digital eight handicam quote brings clarity to even this situation, end quote. Maybe, maybe not. Okay, uh, I don't think Travis is in the room. I wanted to show him this. One. Some of you who used to shop at Kmart, um, they're still around, I guess, are they? Or they've been wiped out by Walmart. Okay, but one of their big things was a Ken attention Kmart shopper, and a blue light would go on in the area where, you know, the sale was. And all I could think was, if you had had a UFO related experience like Travis involving a blue light this is not necessarily good salesmanship this is when you might leave the store okay again the greatest surprise I had in assembling this material was how many ads revolved around the theme, the theme of abduction and I could trace them back to 1976. Travis's abduction was in 1975, and it was the one that caused international attention. 
for the first time since the Hill case became public, happened in 61, made public in 65. So let's see what we have here. First abduction related ad uh, I was able to find is this one. And the copy is, uh, first I should say it's New England Life. Surprising a number of these are life insurance companies. Um, the copy is our doom campers last words before being snatched. Uh, my insurance company, New England Life, of course. Why? You can laugh. I did. Um, we are also told, yes, again, that their uh, financial services and disability insurance are, yes, out of this world. Uh, an ad from uh, the Times of London, uh, a British, uh, the Royal Insurance Company, a similar abduction ad. Um, and again, in the nation's largest newspapers, their copy, and very clever it is, it's pouring with rain. You're miles from anywhere, and your car has just disappeared into thin air. Then you see strange lights coming through the trees toward you. Aliens? More likely, it will be our 24-hour rescue service. Very British. This one made a huge smash. Um, AT&T, 1992, when cellular phones were still fairly prestigious, fairly expensive, and um, most of us didn't have them. This ad asks, quote, at times like this, whose cellular phone would you rather own? End quote. AT&T's, of course, would be the answer because their products are, quote, dependable beyond the ordinary, end quote. This one's rather charming. It's um, for the Connex Railway Update Corporation. Uh, and it is, for me, the most childlike depiction of human and the uh, alien vehicle uh, abduction. Uh, I came across it um, from an Australian colleague. And um, here the alien craft appear to be repurposed lighting fixtures. Uh, one of the lights um, beaming uh, is drawing a tiny plastic figure right into it while two other little plastic UFO witnesses look on mutely. Um, Connex, what they do is quite clever and it's embodied in their copy. If your train is late, they will let you know telephonically or on your handheld device and quote, whatever the delay, we'll text you right away. From Canada's co cooperations insurance, quote, the insurance you need for the surprises you don't. An ad from uh, Brazil, from uh, Fiat Brazil, and their subsidiary, Millet. Okay, uh, returning once more to Long's horseradish sauce. Keep it in the theme here. Seguros Insurance, uh, a company in the Dominican Republic, in um, a 1976 book um, that I was referring to before called Mystery Stalks the Prairie. The um, cattle mutilation phenomena was discussed for the first time in print. Um, we see here a, another poor automobile being lifted off the road, and, um, well, it speaks for itself, basically. This is an Ecuadorian ad for barbed wire. And the copy is, we protect your cattle from almost everything. Nice. Phillips vacuum cleaners. Uh, European ad. <laughs> and their copy is simply three words and they're fabulous. Their strongest yet. Choluta hot sauce. Uh, product that comes to us from Singapore. A 2010 ad. Cows and cars, damn. Okay. 2008 ad from the Master Lock Company um, claimed that their product was, quote, tough enough for any job. I call this a lack of truth in advertising.
this is a, a wonderful image um, from America's independent electric light and power companies collectively. Extraterrestrial themed ads have been prevalent throughout broadcast media as well as print ads. I've chosen not to make them part of this talk because I'm hoping to have a future talk revolving around them. I have collected a number of uh, clips from around the world. However, there's one that I do want to bring attention to. Um, for me, old school, I focus here on print ads. They're almost arcane now. A lot of you don't read newspapers anymore. You'll read newspapers online. But there is something for most of us growing up about holding that paper or that magazine. And so we have looked at these images collectively. The ad that I'm talking about, some of you may remember. It was a very radical piece of advertising um, that was uh, sponsored by the Levi's Corporation, 1989. Um, it is in black and white, and it didn't employ any alien or UFO, but it was a subject of much conversation for a short period of time in UFO-related circles. It was actually two ads back to back, um, and they were very similar. Uh, it was very cinema verite, handheld camera, grainy film, with the camera focusing on the torso, essentially from chest to right above the knee, in a party kind of scene, with voiceovers, with background noise. And um, in the ad, um, what we hear is a voice says, does anyone believe in UFOs? And affirmative background sounds come up. The voice then states, America is hosting EBs. What are EBs, somebody says. Uh, EBs are extraterrestrial beings and America is hosting them. Oohs and ahs follow. Cut. The term EB, E-B-E, -B -E, strictly speaking, is extraterrestrial biological entity. It comes to us from an early piece of uh, UFO-related paperwork where the term is employed relative to a member of MJ-12, Dr. Detlev Bronk, who is alleged to have overseen the first actual uh, autopsy of an alien. Um, the term really has never entered popular culture, unlike UFO or gray. Um, however, it's sort of a cute three letters. It's not impossible that somebody could have hit on it at an advertising agency um, and just went with it. It's, you know, sort of very hip. And again, it's Levi's, certainly one of the hippest products. It got me to thinking uh, about this possible connection between the corporate world and, you know, call it the secret government or those working groups within organizations and agencies that deal with this subject. And I started to drill down. What I learned was that the um, CEO of Levi Strauss at the time was a man named Bob Haas. And like a lot of major multinational corporation executives, he was on boards of trustees of different organizations. In his case, one of them was the Brookings Institution. Brookings is a private think tank that was chartered uh, by the Air Force in about 1960. And they deal with problems and position papers put to them under contract and generate you know, thoughts and uh, results from their think tank. We know that as early as 1961, Brookings did a major paper on uh, secret uh, uh, for the government on the impact of disclosure, for lack of a better word. Uh, and they advised against it for all the reasons that you might imagine, mass panic, etc. cetera. Um, and I made a connection that really impressed me and got me kind of excited. Here was a case where an ad that was on major television for several months, a pair of ads geared to 20-somethings primarily in terms of style, content, 
short attention span, etc., connected a major captain of business with a foundation um, um, that worked on secret government papers relative to UFOs. And I thought, here's, here's where I go. This is how I end the paper. This is great. I continued to try to find any other connection, and I couldn't. Now, where does that leave us? It means that maybe Bob Haas uh, was aware that either working with or under his own you know, uh, idea that this is something I should do to implant that thought a little bit in the American consciousness, do my part, or that his ad agency just came up with the idea. Either somebody had read, you know, uh, UFOs was a hobby. Maybe they were, you know, an amateur ufologist. They were familiar with the term EB or not, because it's not extraterrestrial biological entity in the ad. It's extraterrestrial beings, and they're here now, and America's hosting them. Hosting them. So, where do we live off? UFO ads sell products, and there may be absolutely nothing else to it. Some ads are informed and well informed by specific facts that we now know in the research community and are very aware of the ideas of back engineer abduction. I even found one at the last minute about implants for a techno corporation I wasn't able to put in uh, this week. Um, so it's an open question. I hope you've enjoyed the talk and thank you for your attention. Uh, do we have time for questions or is that going to... Okay. Okay. Um, if you have any questions, we've got a mic right over there. Step right up. Yeah, can we turn on that mic? Just because I want everybody to hear your question. Hello? Hello? There okay. you go. Yeah, I have a, um, a comment. I was a little disappointed that you, uh, when you did the food section, you didn't include a food that I grew up with uh, and was very fond of during the 1960s and 70s, and that, of course, was Quisp cereal. That's my first memory of a, of a UFO alien being used in advertising, and it's a fond memory. Good point. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Sir? How about at the carnivals um, when kids, instead of Cupid dolls, they're all getting these inflatable alien things. It's kind of weird that they're all walking around with E.T., you know, aliens. And M&M's, for some reason, went didn't get in with the E.T. thing. It went to Skittles. M&M's, for some reason, didn't want to be uh, in there from Mars candy, and you know, but they didn't do it. It was Skittles that E.T. went after, not M&M's. You know, who knows ultimately what informs these decisions? In the world of advertising products, we can deduce that it's about, do we think working with this theme will help us make more money? Period. And um, do you get into TV shows like My Favorite Martian, Mork and Mindy? Yeah. Perhaps sometime you might want to do, you know, uh, I think Dick Van Dyke had a weird episode one time. Well, one could, uh, you know, I remember the one with Ralph Cramden as the spaceman going to. Uh, there are so many permutations. I, I, I should say here that if there's one thing that I concluded at the end of doing this research project, it was advertisers believe UFOs and aliens are real if they are interested in Envir spray, if they eat steak, if they use American Express credit cards, if they take their insurance from this company, if they eat this kind of chocolate bar. Otherwise, they don't. All of these ads have an underpinning of a wink, wink, nod, nod, a smile. Even when the copy gets serious or the research is in somewhat in depth, none of these ads are geared to push the seriousness of the subject or its implications. They're all about selling products. And they like to get you young and get you hooked, right? Now, skateboarding, I think most people, except for Tony Hawk, stopped skateboarding after the teen years. But I noticed one of the first things was skateboarding was big on the ET face. Yeah. And that's young people and get them young and associate play with joy with the ET. Well, um, you're absolutely right. Uh, I think there's something we should all be aware of. Uh, we don't see this audience filled with teenagers and 20-somethings. They're busy doing stuff. 
they're inundated with electronic information. They're keeping up with their friends on Facebook and on their iPhones. Um, I remember years ago having a talk with my niece and nephew when they were in the early 20s, and the gist of it was Uncle Peter. Of course we take what you do seriously. Of course we believe that Anne Helen was abducted by aliens, but you have to understand, you know, we're focused on will there be jobs for us? Um, you know, um, will there be a world when we move forward? All of our friends take this seriously, but they don't do it for a living. I mean, they stop short of saying, get a life. I thought I had one up until that moment. Um, but I think that base of people, it's understood. The government doesn't tell us the truth about it. UFOs are real. They visit the Earth. Unknown beings come and go from other dimensions, other planets, other solar systems, other universes. Um, that's not a bad thing, but that's understood for them. Their focus is other things as well. Lastly, um, you mentioned Ralph Cramden. Jackie Gleason was a big... Uh... Yes, you're absolutely right. Gleason, who is a brilliant comic and a great actor, um, had a library, I understand, of over 1,100 books on UFOs and the paranormal, many of which went to, um, I believe, Duke University when he died, which has a large department of paranormal studies, uh, but was a major student of the UFO subject. Hi. Hi. Um, I have two comments or a question. Um, I find this image the most empowering. The others, after a while, humorous, then a little off-putting maybe, and then my recognition that they're disempowering to some degree and distasteful. That's the first comment. I wonder if you'd say something about that. And the second thing is, um, if you're familiar with Edward Bernays, um, an advertising sort of magnet from, or policy, cultural policy maker th in, on the governmental level some years back. If you could comment about his role in advertising. Edward Bernays, if you are familiar with him, it's all right then. But the first will be fine if you just want to address well, that. Thank first you. First of all, in our crazy world, knowledge is power. Uh, I was reminded of it like a week ago when we had the solar eclipse, and I'm sure at one point or another, whether you saw it or part or not, to me part of what always goes through my mind when I hear about it is in ancient cultures, if you were among <clears throat> the priest or the privileged class that had inherited the tradition or developed the advanced mathematics to actually know an eclipse was coming, to be able to predict it, you were one step away from being a god. You had the power. It didn't matter that it only came once in your lifetime. People knew that you had called it. I think some of these ads suggest that, yes, we're selling you a product, but guess what? We know something you don't, and you should be aware of it, maybe. And we're dealing with it here playfully. Again, it's always a challenge trying to put yourself in somebody else's head. I've worked one summer as a teenager in an ad agency. I was a graphic artist before I was a fine artist, and um, I remember thinking, this is definitely what I do not want to do with my life. But I was amazed at the power and the intelligence and the creativity of these people in generating revenue for the most mundane things and pumping them up to, I must have that product. That's amazing. So American advertising, you know, in a weird way we should be proud of it is probably one of the most successful things Americans do is advertise products and um, it's an aside a footnote to the serious study of the UFO phenomenon. Hi I just wanted to mention a couple of ads that you might want to include even though they're more modern. Sure. One is um, Volkswagen Beetle quote-unquote reverse you engineered from UFOs and the other one that's new that's been on cable TV a lot is about um, a home freezer dryer system and in the background of one of them it says you know you'll be ready for anything and they show a cow being lifted into a UFO it's pretty hilarious <laughs> excellent so, thanks. excellent thank you any other questions ah, great thank you for your presentation um, I lived on Long Island for many years and I 
worked at an ad agency and oh, became a fine artist, um, actually a science fiction artist. Um, Feel but free my, to steal anything you've seen today, please. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, my question is, I know that these are a lot of small companies that are, you know, having humorous um, ads as far as the alien situation goes, but is part of the bigger thing where the government wanted to put out disinformation and create the whole, oh, this is funny, you're crazy. Um, do you think that um, this was part of that larger campaign? I have to say, maybe. I am really clear when I don't know something, and I will always parse what I know absolutely, could prove in a court of law, to what I'm convinced is true, but can't prove, to what I think, to what I hope, to what I fear. So yeah, solid maybe, sorry about that. <laughs> Sir. Yes, two things. Are you familiar with it? Sometimes uh, companies name themselves after UFO themes. One current company would be uh, Alienware, which makes high-end computers. Big computer, computer company. I remember Bell. when they broke in with their logo, the face. Yeah, and, and a lot of their uh, computers are uh, like shaped like face of the aliens. And another thing you mentioned, like uh, record covers, a lot of them have UFO themes. This t-shirt is from a band called UFO, and they have many UFO themes. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, I'm going to call it. I know you all want to get out to lunch and have an alien secretion with lunch or dinner. 